Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm really happy today to be introducing Professor Zhao Young Zhang, who's now an associate professor of uh, pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Zhao Young did her PhD at Brown with David Kane, and then she moved to do a postdoc with Suzanne Walker, which is where I kind of overlapped with her. And at that time, I was amazed by Zhao Young. She's really energetic. She took it upon herself to learn everything about mass spectrometry and traveled around the country to do that. Uh, and by doing that, she learned a lot about the proteolytic activities of um, OGT or oglycanic transferase and uh, discovered small molecules that mo you know, modulated that enzyme. And so uh, Jia Young has won a lot of awards. Her work is really exciting. And today she's gonna talk a little bit about the flip side of OGT, which is oglycanic. Eight. Okay, Jia Young, take it away. Okay, um, thank you for the uh, nice introduction, Tanya. Um, and uh, also, uh, you know, thank for the opportunity to have me here to share some of our research. Um, and so uh, I'm at UW Madison. And then so you can see this is our school pharmacy building and uh, my lab is somewhere uh, maybe here, uh, if you haven't visited, and then uh, so welcome all of you to visit uh, UW Madison, especially in the fall. That's the the best season. I like it. Um, and then um, so my lab at a here uh, we are interested in protein glycosylation. When talking about this topic, uh, many of you are familiar with the one that uh, happened in the ER and the Golgi. And then um, like an unlinked and the O-linked glycosylation, they usually involved in uh, protein folding and then quality control. And uh, you know, mature the glycoprotein can be secreted uh, where that can be translocated to the cell membrane to mediate cell-cell uh, -cell interactions. And this is a picture that for many of you uh, is familiar with, uh, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I'm going to actually talk about a unique type of a protein glycosylation, and that is happening in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And that just a single sugar is gluconac, and then we call it an old gluconacylation. You will see the chemistry in a minute, um, but that can modify a variety of a biological processes. And so that's why we are interested. And so you can see that in the nucleus of the cell, and this old gluconacylation can uh, modify histone proteins and uh, RNA polymerase II, the central machinery for gene expression, and then to nearly every transcription factor of RNA polymerase II. And then, um, so that's why it's so important uh, for transcription. And then um, it also can regulate the protein localization, and then it can regulate metastasis and then apoptosis, and you can also um, usually increase the stability of the protein. So if you have a, a gluconac modified on a protein that can prevent the proteasome from uh, degrading the protein and so increase the stability. And more importantly, this uh, old gluconac modification can, uh, much like a just phosphorylation, can regulate a variety of a signal uh, transduction. And then uh, there is actually lots of a crosstalk between phosphorylation and this old gluconac modification. So that can happen on the same site and uh, were on the neighboring site on a protein. And then uh, also this modification is important to regulate the cytoskeletal uh, reorganization. And so you can see that a variety of uh, cellular processes uh, can be regulated by this modification. And then so that's why it's very important to maintain the homeostasis of this modification. So in the normal status, right, a healthy uh, status, and the cells trying to maintain the, uh, the normal level of this modification. And then that will be important uh, for the immune response, neural functions, organ functions, cytoskeletal function. Uh, and then um, this is also a mechanism for the cells to respond to a variety of uh, nutrient or stress uh, stimulations. Uh, for example, have a starvation or chemical treatment and then the cell will immediately respond to that. And the cell trying to maintain the gluconeck level in the normal range. 
But when you go beyond that, you will impair all the functions that I, as I mentioned. And then when this dysregulation become more severe, and that you may link to a variety of uh, human disease, including cancer, Alzheimer's disease, uh, cardiovascular, uh, and uh, diabetes. And so that's why what I'm showing you is that this O-gluconeic modification, this single sugar modification is very important uh, for biology and uh, studying disease. And then, um, so let's look at the chemistry. And so chemically speaking, this is this red sugar, uh, O-gluconeic. Um, so that is called N-acetylglucosamine. Uh, uh, you can call it gluconeic in short. And then that can be transferred from the sugar donor uridine diphosphate or UDP gluconeic to the serine or threonines of a proteins. So this red part is gluconeic and is O linkage. So this is called O gluconacylation or O gluconeic modification. And this modification is catalyzed by the enzyme OGT that refers to the o gluconeic transferase. So it's the enzyme add a sugar and then to having uh, this uh, uh, modification generated. And then this is also a reversible modification. So we have a, a hydrolase, uh, this is called o gluconeacase or OGA in short, that can cleave this bond and return to the unmodified protein. And so this is a dynamic process, add on sugar and remove the sugar. And so this is much like you learn from protein, phosphorylation, right? Have a kinases added and then phosphatase can hydrolyze the modification. However, in comparison to like hundreds of uh, kinases and the phosphatase in our body, we only have one gene encoded OGT another gene encoded OGA in our body. But then there are thousands of protein substrates um, modified with this modification has been uh, discovered. So many of those modified proteins involved in transcription, translation, metabolism, structure, signaling, and a cell cycle. And then so you can see they played many important functions, but then all of this, um, reversible O-gluconacylation is only characterized by a single pair of enzymes, so OGT and OGA. And you can see it's very amazing that just a single pair of enzymes can do this uh, dynamic O-gluconeic modification on thousands of protein substrates and without a conserved sequence motif. So um, there is, a, I mean, many questions about this modification. So in my lab, uh, one part of our study is interested in understanding how the enzymes add a sugar or remove the sugar that can recognize the substrates. We have been using structural biology and some other approaches to elucidate beyond the catalytic site of the enzyme, whether there's some additional uh, sites that can contribute to the, uh, substrate recognition. And if so, we can probably target those sites, right, to avoid uh, perturbing the global o group isolation. And then another part of study, we have been developing chemical tools, for example, inhibitors, cross-linkers, and we use them to elucidate the substrate recognition of the enzymes I mentioned about, and then to also hope to identify those uh, modified proteins and to also facilitate a functional study. Yeah, we also use more biochemical and some biological um, uh, methods to uh, study the function of o gluconeic modified proteins. And so this is our uh, research program that, um, you know, uh, related to o gluconeic part. And so for this talk, I will be mainly uh, focused on some structure studies on the uh, enzyme that are involving in o gluconeic uh, hydrolysis, that's OGA. And then to, if time allows, uh, I will probably briefly mention um, a very short story about some chemical probe, okay? And so now um, we are going to talk about this OGA is the enzyme that hydrolyzes the sugar return into this unmodified form. And then how OGA recognizes uh, numerous substrates remains unclear. The challenges are uh, including uh, the lack of a, a well-defined sequence motif in the substrate proteins, 
as I mentioned about. And then to also for a long time, there's a lack of a structure of a human OJ. So in the absence of a human OJ structure uh, in this field, people have trying to use biochemical methods or obtaining like bacteria homologs of OJ to study the catalytic mechanism. And then also trying to understand the substrate recognition. However, uh, two different hypotheses have uh, you know, been generated during these studies. And uh, one hypothesis uh, is um, basically focusing on the sugar. So the hypothesis is that the OGA only cares about the sugar and then doesn't care about the peptide. And that's how the OGA recognizes the substrate. And the second hypothesis is that OJ will not only recognize the sugar, but also care about the peptide part. And so that part may, you know, provide some additional recognition feature uh, for the OJ. And so with those two kind of controversial uh, type of hypothesis, and then my lab have been uh, set up a goal trying to obtain the structure of a human OJ, and then it's complex with the structures and to understand this fundamental question in the field. Okay, so talking about human OJ is a, a large protein. Um, so that has multiple domains. The magenta color at here is showing you is a catalytic domain. And then uh, the cyan color at here is a stock domain. Uh, and then so there is an orange color highlighted HAT means histone domain. And this is a pseudo histone acetyltransferase domain is because previously, people have uh, reported uh, some activity of this uh, HADA domain uh, for transferring um, acetyl group to histones, but then so that experiment uh, cannot be reproduced by many other labs. Uh, and also more recently, some paper are showing that this domain cannot bind to acetyl-CoA. And so that's why this is considered as a pseudo domain and its function still uh, remains unknown. And then so um, for this uh, human OJ, so this protein actually you can purify it, it's soluble. And then so you can use that for the biochemical assays without a problem. Um, but then people have tried so many years uh, trying to obtain the crystal structure without success. And then to one of the main challenges that there is that um, the, the OGA contains a number of uh, disorder regions. And then I use a white color to highlight some of this. And then so uh, those are disorder regions prevent uh, getting a, a good structure, right, for, the, for this protein. And so first step, we have uh, tried to obtain a suitable construct uh, so that could be truncated, um, right, removing those uh, flexible parts and then trying to obtain that construct for crystallization. And after a number of trials, we identify OGA Chris, and this is a truncated construct you can see, consists of a, a catalytic domain and a stock domain. And we use a short linker to uh, replace this flexible disorder region in the stock domain. And then uh, we, uh, so later I will show you some data that this uh, OGA Chris construct um, possess essential properties with this full length OJ. And then we use that to obtain crystal structures and then to study how that uh, recognizes the subjects and so on. And so with this OJ crystal construct, we obtained some nice crystals uh, like here, and then to determine the structure at a 2.5 uh, angstrom. And then surprisingly, we found that this structure actually is a dimer. So it has a, uh, this gray color showing you is one monomer, and then the other one is a color coded. And so we have this catalytic domain is a magenta color uh, showing this uh, is here, this part of catalytic domain. And then this uh, sign color here, uh, that is the stock domain. Okay. And then so when we overlay the two monomers together, uh, we can see, oh, this is a, a very featured, uh, right? A catalytic domain in the glycoside hydrolase 84 family of enzymes. This is called a, a beta alpha eight barrel uh, type of structure because you have eight uh, beta sheets surrounded by eight alpha helices and then forming this kind of barrel type of shape. And then the sugar binds here gets hydrolyzed. So this is a calorie domain. And this part is highly conserved between human and the bacteria uh, OGAs. Uh, but then beyond that, like a stock domain or HAT domain, they have a dramatic difference. 
uh, between the human and the bacteria proteins. And we think the other domains may also contribute to the substrate uh, recognition. So it's important to have a human structure to understand that. Okay, so when talking about this dimer structure, we, well, we were surprised that was because many of the bacteria, OGA homologs, uh, those are structures um, and the studies are showing that uh, they could be monomers. And then to, in our case that uh, here is a dimer. So we took a closer look at it. And in this uh, figure at uh, here, the yellow color showing you the uh, the inter uh, at the interface between the two, uh, the dimers, and then you can see that actually consists of about twenty percent of the surface area of a monomer. So it's very significant, and then suggesting the very stable, uh, right, tight binding uh, between the the dimer. And then so we also validate this study because this is a crystallization, right? We use um, the analytical ultra centrifugation experiment to study the, um, the uh, status of the uh, OGA, both OGA Chris and the full length OGA. And we found that in the solution, um, th both the proteins exist in stable dimers. And then at least in the range that we tested between zero to one milligram per mil. So it's very stable, is a tight uh, dimer. Uh, and so I want to point out that in the same year, two other groups also reported a similar dimerized OJ structure using slightly different uh, constructs and then also supporting this uh, dimerized uh, structure of OJ. And then um, so we uh, further tested um, the catalytic activity of this truncated uh, OGA crisp. And then you can see the catalytic activity is uh, the uh, property looks like this. And then full length OGA is, uh, is uh, you know, slightly different, but they are, uh, you know, similar enough. And we think that um, this OJ crisp has the essential properties as a full length OJ. And so that's why we use this construct, right? Use this structure to go ahead to study the, uh, the mechanism, the details in the active side of OJ, and then also how this enzyme recognize different substrates. Okay, so uh, to study the active side part, uh, we used a, a transition state mimic inhibitor, uh, SIMIG, that was developed by the Viva Carlos group. Uh, and so uh, we synthesized this uh, compound and then co-crystallized with OGA. And you can see that the compound, uh, each of this um, binds into the catalytic site of this enzyme. And then uh, we compare this a complex structure with the apple form of uh, OGA and to see whether there's some significant differences. And then to overall, actually the overlay show they are pretty much the same and only a few loops, uh, they have some changes. And I want to point it out that one is this D loop, actually, uh, this is uh, the loop that uh, harboring two essential catalytic residues. One is this D174, and the other one is D175. So the apple form structure is in the sign color and the complex is in the magenta color. So there is an overlay. And you can see that there's a significant uh, like a movement of this D loop towards of the compound uh, in this complex structure you can see. And so this is uh, supporting that the enzyme actually is closing up the active site to stabilize the transition state during the catalysis. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the mechanism in a minute, um, but so this is supporting that. And then to, uh, from this structure, we also identify a number of uh, uh, important residues um, for catalysis. And then to identify ancillary residues, for example, lysine 98, uh, tyrosine 219, those residues um, to uh, you know, facilitate this reaction. And then to very interestingly, we also um, notice there's an ordered water molecule labeled with W1 at here. That's a sitting right on top of the anomeric carbon. And that is ready for the second stage of a sugar hydrolysis. So let me show you about that. So this structure actually provides the direct um, structure evidence to support a substrate assisted mechanism of OJ that was previously uh, established using uh, some compound analogs or bacteria OJs. Okay, so this mechanism involves um, the first step is this uh, uh, aspartate uh, 174 that activates or polarizes this uh, uh, amide uh, bond of this uh, sugar. So this is the gluconic. And then this R group could be a peptide or a protein. 
And then so you can see that there's a, a attack of this anomeric carbon and then to form a, a bicyclic oxonal type of uh, uh, intermediate. And then this R group uh, can leave uh, and then the water can come in at a here. And so this water can be activated by another catalytic residue. This uh, spotted 175 can activate it now to attack this anomeric carbon and to facilitate the opening of this ring. So that will also through a similar bicyclic uh, intermediate and then open up this ring. So you get a sugar hydrolyzed. You can see here is the OH. And then this is OR. So you break this glycosidic bond. And then you can see that this hydrolysis reaction actually retains uh, the sterile chemistry at this anomeric carbon, right? And then also because this reaction involving using the substrate itself, this glucan and acetyl group, to catalyze the reaction. So it's called a substrate assisted mechanism. And then so now I show the MIG, this inhibitor in another representation, and then you can see how close this is uh, to the transition state out of here, right? And then um, also this is that water molecule I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, if you uh, recall here, is this water molecule sitting right on top of this anomeric uh, carbon that is facilitating or well, ready to uh, do the hydrolysis, opening up this ring to hydrolyze the sugar. Okay, so basically the structure um, uh, determined with this uh, SIMIG, and then that supports uh, definitely provide direct evidence to support this uh, mechanism. And then also identify a number of important residues for catalysis during the sugar hydrolysis. And then also um, we expect that uh, can facilitate uh, the development of even better uh, OGA inhibitors. And this is of uh, great interest for basic research and some therapeutic use as well. And currently there are three OGA inhibitors in phase one clinical trials. Uh, and then so uh, the potential role, so it's not clear yet, but a, a proposed role for this OGA inhibitor to use in that case is based on observation that um, in vitro, in cell line and animal models, if you inhibit OGA, and then that can enhance O gluconate level, especially on a tau protein that can stabilize the microtubules, and then that can um, basically increase the O gluconate level on the tau protein, and then that can reduce the, the uh, phosphorylation level. That is what you will usually see in those Alzheimer's disease patients. And then so you protein solubility and to reduce the aggregation of a tau protein and there. This could be a um, you know, potential role for this OGA can bring this beneficial effect uh, in this disease model. And so that's why there's uh, lots of interest in developing uh, you know, OGA inhibitors and we hope the structure uh, was uh, you know, reported here. That could be very um, uh, interesting and then to help design uh, even better OGA inhibitors uh, for biomedical research and uh, uh, targeting disease. Okay. And so, um, so now we come back uh, to talk about the subject recognition. This is, we try to understand how this OJ recognizes subjects, and we have been using the glycopeptide subjects. Those are the uh, peptides uh, modified with the old gluconac. And the example I'm showing you at here uh, is uh, derived from the tumor surprise of P53. And so P53 has a non, uh, uh, old gluconac modification site on a serine residue. And so we synthesize the peptide and then the modified with old gluconac there and then obtain the complex with OJ. So this is a, a small video, let me uh, show you here. So this is a, a dimer I, I mentioned uh, before, right? It's a dimer. So you have a one monomer is in the white color and then the other monomer is color coded. So you have a, a sign color uh, highlighting the stock domain and the orange color uh, showing the catalytic domain. So you can see it's a stock domain of a one monomer uh, covers the catalytic domain of another monomer to form a cleft and substrate binds here. We call it substrate binding cleft. And those are green balls are P53 peptides. And the sugar part is shown in this uh, brownish color uh, at the bottom and that uh, binds deep into the active site. So you can see the active site is very deep, narrow. 
and then sugar nicely uh, will tightly actually bond into this active site and making a number of interactions with active site residues. And you can see those interactions involving uh, uh, hydrophobic interactions, but also a number of uh, polar interactions, tightly anchored sugar, and explaining the, uh, the specificity of this sense and hydrolyzing that just this sugar, but not other type of sugar. In talking about peptide power, you can see that has an intra molecular interaction to stabilize the conformation, but then also um, have uh, detected a number of interactions that uh, between the peptide and the uh, and the stock domain, uh, like uh, we call this as a uh, substrate binding cleft residues. And so we have been uh, trying to mutate it, um, the peptide residue, for example, on the peptide side, uh, where on the enzyme, there's a cleft surface, and then to, we detected a significant to reduce the binding. And if you remember uh, what I mentioned about two hypotheses before, right? So this is structure supporting that um, the uh, second hypothesis that OJ not only recognize the sugar part, but also the peptide part can contribute to some additional binding. And then OJ may be more favorable binding to certain type of substrates and remove sugar from those. Okay, so this is just one, right? This is a P53 peptide. But what about many other peptides? They have a very different uh, flanking sequences and the oglucnide could be modified on the uh, steering or the swinging. And we have uh, solved uh, five of the complexes and overlaid them together. These are the only five um, reported so far. And then you can see that, um, so the sugar part, they are highly overlapped, uh, right? Uh, binding almost identically in the active site. And then uh, this is the, the backbone of those uh, five peptides. And then near the oglucanide size, they bind uh, in a V-shaped conformation. But interestingly, you can see that they can run from N-terminal to C-terminal or C-terminal to N-terminal. So it's a bi-directional uh, binding. But then they actually have a very different uh, sequences and then they are making uh, very different interactions with those uh, surface residues. So I use a pink color and the purple color to highlight those uh, differential interactions. And then, um, so this is again, um, highlighting that the peptide parts uh, can contribute to some additional uh, binding and interactions. So we are now based on uh, those uh, studies, we have now, um, uh, trying to study the structural features of OJ uh, in cells. So that will be full lens uh, protein and how that contribute to the biology and, uh, and the disease. Okay, so with that, I would like to uh, summarize this first part. So I've shown you the structures of a human OJ in apple form uh, with a, a small molecule uh, inhibitor and then also in a complex with each of the five distinct uh, glycopeptides. And then uh, this provides uh, the first model of eukaryotic uh, glycoside hydrolase 84 family of enzymes. So this is a dimer. And then the dimer actually forms uh, the substrate binding clefts and then the peptides binding to, uh, in, uh, in the cleft. And if I show the, for example, this one in the sterile uh, surface model, and you can see that the sugar part is at here, and then the peptide part is standing up in this cleft. So that actually highlighting a, a different, actually there's a new recognition model uh, for this the human OJ, and that is distinct from the previously reported bacteria homologs of OJ, because Many of those, everybody, uh, they, uh, they are like monomers and they wouldn't have the substrate binding uh, cleft. And even for the same peptide, they will bind very differently. And we have, done, uh, have compared that. Okay, so this provides a crucial starting point for understanding the uh, substrate recognition of OJ and the dynamic uh, oglucanic regulation. So uh, do I have time to move on for the second Sorry, part? Sorry, Jiayang, we're out of time for this section. Um, okay, so- Come back again and you'll, you can give the second part. Yeah, sure. Then let me finish the, the acknowledgement. How's okay. that? Okay, so then with that, I would like to thank uh, our organizers for Glyconnect uh, and ACS um, for putting together this webinar series. It's really fantastic. And then for the structure part, I would like to thank 
that was uh, mainly conducted by my former postdoc, uh, Bao Bingli, and then the graduate student, Hao Li. And then I also would like to thank uh, the staff member at APS ASCAT um, at a, a national uh, like a laboratory um, at Argonne. Uh, and then they help us collect the X-ray uh, data and then our collaborator for mass spec analysis and the funding support. So thank you for listening. I would like to take any questions you may have.